All right, good afternoon, everybody. Before we get started, would you pray with me? God, thank you for this day, and thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. Thank you today that you have a word for us and that you just continue to speak to us. God, that you've chosen us to be your people. Lord, today, open up our hearts and our ears, what you have for us today. Help us to be receptive. Help us to have some humility as we come and receive your word today. In your name we pray. Amen. Before we get started, uh, last week we started talking about some of the new things that God was going to do in our church. And we talked about how we might not know what those things are. Uh, we might not know what God is leading us to. But yet we know that God is bringing us into a new season in our church. And so today we're going to have a guest speaker. and He's going to be preaching for the next several weeks. And his name is Billy Bland, so if you guys can give him a big round of applause as he comes up here, all right? Thank you. All right. Hey. All right. Just one minute, guys. better can you hear me all right well good afternoon guys I'm really glad to be with you guys today I'm really excited for the things that God's doing and uh, the things that he's uh, been continuing to show me in my life and ministry the things that he's been showing Caleb it's really incredible stuff things that if you weren't excited about you just have to be dead but Today we got some things that I want to talk about regarding the way, the truth, and the life. We as Christians know that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. However, believe it or not, there's a whole group of people, a whole world of people that would say otherwise. A lot of people will give uh, Christ a tip of the hat they give Christ this you know respect in saying that he's a good teacher they would give Christ respect in saying that he was even a good prophet but to say that he's the only way to eternal life a lot of people would say that's a little bit exclusive that's a little bit uh, bold to say there's this woman that I got to meet in Franklin Grove over the last week and as I knocked on her door to just pass out some flyers, she invited me in to, you know, meet her husband and to just chum it up a little bit. So as we're talking, I let her know that we're starting a church over in Franklin Grove, that we're starting a, a school over in Mount Morris. And as I was talking to her, she was all excited about the fact that there's a church coming to town. She let me know also that she believes that every walk of life kind of gets to the same end. You know, she literally went like this. It all goes to the same spot. We all get to heaven one way or another. She says that whether you're a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Hindu, even atheists can get to heaven as long as they're good people as long as they behave in a good way, in a godly kind of way. You know, you're nice to people, you don't commit crime all the time, and her understanding, you don't play your music too loud while you're driving past her house. But she believes that every walk of life kind of goes to the same place. And that's a trigger phrase for me. Whenever I hear that, it was almost like I spewed out this retort that, well, the Bible says that Jesus told us 
I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father but by me. And I said that, and it was her response was, yeah, well, we get a, a more direct shot, but others kind of got to go through this. I don't know what this was, but that's what she said. I kind of dropped it right there and just continued to tell her about the church and the different things that we're planning on doing in the community. She told me her concerns that she has for the community. But I left that spot, and I couldn't shake that conversation away. I couldn't just stop thinking about how she said every walk of life ends up in the same area. And it wasn't just the fact that she had said that to me. It was the fact that she can't be the only one that believes this. I've been confronted with that same um, theological understanding or the same understanding of God from several different people, not just this one woman. And so all the way home that night, I couldn't stop thinking about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. I'm going to go into some detail about that later, but the thing that really shocks me is that this isn't just a secular belief. This belief has also made its way into the church. People think that their salvation a lot of times depends on how well they behave, how well they follow the rules. People believe that if you're not good at being a Christian, you're not getting into heaven. And what that tells me is that somehow your salvation is dependent on you and what you can do. That yes, Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. Yes, he was the son of God. And yes, he rose three days later. But ultimately, it comes down to how good of a person are you? I'll tell you what, I'm not that great of a guy. I, my past, I've got, I've got a rap sheet as long as my arm. And if it were to depend on how good of a person I am and have been, I would be way, way under, under the bar. Thankfully, I don't have to stand before God and, and present all of my good works and all my good deeds in order to get into heaven. There was a man that did that for me. So I want to ask, why is it that we end up believing this? Why is it that we end up believing that somehow it comes down to how well behaved we are as people? And the only thing that keeps coming up to me is that we have an enemy who is a liar, a deceiver. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. If he can't kill you, and if he can't steal from you, he's going to destroy your walk. And if he can't destroy your walk, he's going to steal your reputation. That's what we have to battle. And that's why this invasive belief that everything that we do is, is what we're going to have to stand before God with, and hopefully he'll accept us into heaven. That's what happens to the Christian as we go through this Christian walk. But, thankfully... That's not the case. Thankfully, Jesus Christ stood between us and God and took the judgment for us. Jesus made this statement in John 14, 6. Where he actually, we'll go back to John 14, 4. He says, where I am... There you may be also, and you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. If you want to know how to get into heaven, you need to know the way. Jesus is the way. I was on the way back from Franklin Grove thinking about this conversation with this woman. Like I said, I couldn't stop thinking about the crucifixion. Now, if anybody knows about the crucifixion, you've been told that it's the most excruciating thing that anybody could have ever gone through in that time period. It was a, it was a mark of shame to be hung on the cross. They left that for the most vile of uh, 
sinners. They left out for the most heinous of crimes. And Jesus Christ, before the crucifixion, went through something called a scourging. Now, what Jesus endured through the scourging was he was chained up to a block, and he was stripped naked. And they had this whip. This whip on it had many different strands coming off of it. And what they would put in these strands, instead of just whipping him with a, with a bunch of uh, leather, they would take pieces of bone, of broken metal and glass, and they would stick all this stuff into these leather strands. So whenever they whipped you with it, it would grab your skin and it would tear it apart. Over and over and over, he was whipped with this thing. He was hunched over a concrete block, stretching the skin out on his back so that whenever it hit him, it would burst open. He was hit with this whip 39 times. They did half on his back, flipped him over, did half on his belly. So by the time he was done, the fact that he was still alive is incredible. Then what they did is they threw a robe on him. They threw a purple robe over all of his wounds, and then they took this crown that they had fashioned with thorns that had to be about that long, and they forced it down onto his head, causing immense pressure, squeezing on his skull the whole time, blood rushing everywhere with this robe on him. And whenever they had this robe on him, you'd have to think that this blood would dry to the robe. And then they would rip this robe off of him. Reopening all these wounds that he had all over his back, all over his body. And they, were, they put this robe on him. It was a purple robe to mock him for saying that he was a king. Because purple is the color of royalty. So ripping this robe off of him over and over again, opening up all these wounds, having all of his, having his internals exposed, leaking so much blood that on his way to the cross, he literally couldn't carry the cross anymore. They had to have somebody else come and help him the rest of the way to Calvary. Now that's horrible, that hurts, that hurts me to think about. I think about this stuff on the way back from Franklin Grove. As I'm thinking about this, I was crying, thinking that a man went through this. Even watching a sinner, even watching somebody I don't like deal with that, I, couldn't, I wouldn't be able to bear seeing this person deal with that. Even if they'd committed a horrible crime, I couldn't watch somebody go through this because it's just, it's just wrong to see that. But this man did nothing wrong. So, as he's coming to the cross, he's laying down on the wood. He's getting nails put through his wrists and through his feet. Now, if you think about it, they wouldn't put them here. If they were to put him here, his whole body weight would have ripped him off of the cross. It would have torn through his hand. That wouldn't have worked. So they put it through here. Now, I'm sure all of us at one point or another has hit our funny bone, and I'm telling you what, it's one of the worst pains I have ever felt. It make my whole hand go numb. It just, it's really bad. I think that I wish that that would have been in a different spot so I wouldn't hit it so often. However, I do hit it quite often. Um, but that is actually an exposed nerve that you have. This nerve goes all the way from your armpit all the way down to your wrist. And it's actually, it goes right between these bones, because these bones right here in your wrist and your veins and your cartilage actually protect that nerve so that you're not hitting it more often than you already are. And just think, if anybody's ever hit their funny bone, which I'm sure most of us have, it hurts so bad. It's, such a, it's, it's a bright white pain. Well, this, these nails that they put into Jesus weren't the sharpest of nails. They've been used and used and used. So they're probably dull. And so whenever they nailed these nails, these spikes through his wrist, right between the bones so that it would lock him on the cross, it would crush that, that nerve. So imagine having your funny bone exposed and then somebody taking pliers and just crushing it. And so now he's extended like this. 
and his feet. I'm not very flexible, but my feet, I can't get them to lay flat like this. All these pictures that you see of Jesus having a foot holder right, for his feet to be held to, I think that that's a little bit courteous because it says that his feet were nailed to the cross. So his feet were flattened out up against the wood and nailed to the cross. The immense excruciating pain that he had to be in because even though he was losing all that blood, he was in shock from all the agony that he'd gone through with the scourging, you are not going to be able to block out the pain of your nerves being smashed. You're not going to be able to block out the pain of your chest being ripped apart while you're hanging on a cross. And then not only was he put through this torturous event, he was also abandoned by his father. So while he's on the cross, he gets to have a full-on pouring of hopelessness where he doesn't even have God there to comfort him. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was forsaken. He became sin. God will not look on sin. So God turned his back on his beloved, perfect son. While Jesus was in the garden before he went to Calvary, he uh, cried out to God in a prayer that most Christians are pretty familiar with. And he says, if it's at all possible, let this cup pass from me. Let the cup of wrath that I'm about to have to drink from, please let it pass from me. Let there be another way, please. And the reason why he's saying that is because he knows what he's about to go through. Jesus, being fully God, knows the full extent of what God's wrath is. He knows exactly what that means. He knows that this is going to be painful. It's going to be hopeless. It's going to be, I can't, I'm not going to be able to deal with this. God, please, if there's another way, let there be another way. And then he says this incredible verse. He says, but nevertheless, your will be done, not mine. So what he tells God is to say, God, I'm not going to be able to do this. I cannot go through this. Please, Dad, please, don't make me do this. If there's some other way, please let there be another way. And then he stops and he says, but whatever you want, I'll do whatever you want. And he goes to Calvary. There's an incredible verse in Hebrews. In Hebrews 5, verse 7, it says, In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. It says that he was heard because of his piety. There's been times whenever I've prayed and I've been in, in a big, dark hole of sin and I'm praying, God, don't let me go to jail tonight. God, please let my old lady not be mad at me. Let my girlfriend not come down on me. Let my wife not be mad at me. Please don't let me lose this or lose that. And by the grace of God, I didn't. Several times I went to jail. I didn't lose my wife, though. Thank God. However, some of those prayers weren't answered. They weren't heard. In the Bible right here, remember, it's saying that Jesus' prayers were heard. That's an indicator that God answered him and gave him what he was asking for. How awesome is that to think that Jesus is so scared of his own wrath that he cried out and said, God, I can't do it. Please let there be another way. And it tells us in John or in Luke that God sent an angel to strengthen him. He came and he told his disciples, please stop sleeping. I'm grieved even to the point of death. And then 
as he's sweating drops of blood, scared to death, an angel of the Lord, after he prays for there to be another way, an angel of the Lord comes and strengthens him. That's incredible to me. What that tells me is that Jesus really was 100% man because he was so scared because he knew the full extent of what he was about to face, and it scared him literally to death to the fact that he wasn't going to be able to handle what he was going to go through. There was no humanly way he was going to be able to handle what he was going to go through. But God sent an angel to strengthen him. God strengthened our Savior so that he had the ability to endure this. And if you read through the gospel, you'll see that after that angel strengthened him, he got up, dusted himself off, and faced his accuser, faced his betrayer with such a boldness that whenever they, he said, who is, who is it that you seek? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. And as he said, I am he, they all fell to their knees because of the power that came out of him. Letting them know, I am God. And then he gave himself over to them and then went through the scourging and the crucifixion. Jesus, the perfect man, the man that came from heaven, God who became flesh, went through this horrible, horrifying scenario. And to hear someone say, Everyone can get there as long as they're well behaved. You mean to tell me that Jesus Christ went through all that for you to rely on how good you're going to be? There's an analogy that I like to use, and I'm going to share it with you, where there's a man who committed a murder Say, say in these days, a man commits a murder and he leaves town. He skips state. He goes from here all the way to California and for four years he's on the run. And while he's in California, he starts an orphanage. He's, he starts an orphanage. He's helping the homeless on the street. He's making a soup kitchen. He's got a food pantry. He's doing all these good deeds. He's fixing up broken down homes, helping people with their cars, all this stuff. And he does all these good deeds. Well, the cops end up finding him and they take him all the way back to Illinois. And he's standing before a judge. And that same judge is about to see a man who did a bunch of good works and he's there at court to receive a a reward. Now, we know that if the murderer were to stand before the judge and tell the judge, listen, I did all these good things, though. Yes, I know I committed a murder, but I started an orphanage. I fixed these people's cars. I was helping the homeless. I started a soup kitchen. If the judge were to tell him, oh, well, okay, never mind. You're free to go. I didn't know you did all these good things. You're good to go. If the judge were to do that, we would know that that judge is a horrible judge and he should be fired. Because whenever somebody does something wrong, we want justice. We want justice. We want the judge to do what's right. But we think that we can stand before God and say, yeah, I know that I'm a sinner, but I started behaving better. I stopped saying bad words. I stopped looking at bad things. I started being nice to people. And we think that a perfect judge is going to be like, oh, okay, well, I didn't realize that. Come on in. That's not the God that we serve. The God that we serve and believe in is perfect. He's perfectly just. That means that he has perfect justice. And we want that. But if we're not in a relationship with Christ, I'm sorry to tell you. No, no, I'm not sorry to tell you. That's a bad, bad thing for you because he's perfectly just. And just because you feel good about yourself doesn't mean he's going to treat you the way that you feel he should treat you. He's going to punish sin, and it's going to be severe. Anyways, back to the analogy. So this man gets brought back, and he's standing before the judge. This other man that's there to gain all this reward for all the good things that he does is standing there. They're both in line. And the guy that did all the good things looks at the murderer and said, Hey, Switch me name tags. So the murderer looks over at him and says, what? What are you talking about switching name tags? Hurry up, switch me name tags. So they switch name tags. 
and he calls the murderer up to the stand. The guy that switched some name tags steps up, the one that did all the good deeds. And he says, we've been looking for you. Life in prison with the death penalty. And he looks back at the guy that he just switched name tags with, just gives him a nod and walks away. The, the murderer then comes up, and the judge starts giving him all this money, all these rewards, all this praise for all the good deeds that he's done. And all of this guy can think is, but I did, I committed a murder. I did this wrong. That man that switched him name tags, I, if that were me, I would want to spend the rest of my life putting money on this guy's books so that he can buy stuff while he's in prison, uh, sending him letters, sending him pictures, telling him how my family's doing, making sure that I'm not doing anything stupid anymore. And the reason why I want to do all that stuff isn't so that he would switch me name tags so that I wouldn't go to prison. I would do all that stuff because he already did. He already took my place. Jesus Christ already took our place. That should motivate us to do what's right. You did all this stuff. I want to honor you with my life. I want to make sure that I'm doing what pleases you because you went through all this excruciating torture for me. If you've messed up, if you've walked down a road that's dark and you feel defeated and you feel like you're not good enough, there is hope. Jesus Christ died to save our soul. He died to give us life, to live a life of defeat, to live a life of complete destruction and know that you're in that hold and to feel hopeless is such a lie from the enemy because there's a way. There is a way. There's a truth and there's a life. Jesus Christ came so that we could have life and have it to the fullest. Yes, it's wrong to sin. Yes, it's wrong to fall. However, fall forward. Fall forward into grace. Jesus Christ loves you. Do not let the enemy tell you that you've messed up too much to come back. Don't let the enemy tell you that you're no good, that you never were saved in the first place. It says that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. These are the questions that you need to ask yourself. Do I believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God? Do I believe that he died for my sin? Do I believe that he rose again on the third day? If your answers are yes, call out to the, to the Lord and say, Jesus, I need you to save me because if you don't, I'm going to hell forever and I want to be with you, the one that loves me. It's funny because in John 14, 6, let me get back there really quick. It doesn't say this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to heaven but through me. It says no one comes to the Father but through me. Our joy and our fulfillment is found in that relationship that we have with the Father. We are to be satisfied in God. But a lot of times all we can think about is those streets of gold. All we can think about is the mansion that we're supposed to be moving into. We're supposed to, we, a, a lot of people are thinking about like, man, I wonder if I'm going to get on a cloud and play a harp. That's going to be so cool. And yes, all those things are going to be cool. But the reason why those things are cool is because of the one that we're with, the one whose glory lights up all of heaven. There isn't even going to be a sun anymore because of his glory is going to give light. And that's the one that wants to be in a relationship with us. It's incredible to think that, you know, I have, a, I have a best friend, and the reason why he's my best friend is because, and this sounds selfish, and I don't care, because of the way that he makes me feel. He makes me feel wanted. He makes me feel like I'm funny sometimes. He makes me feel like what I got to say is important. He cares if I'm down. He cares if I'm going through something. He celebrates whenever I get a win in my life. 
and he is an imperfect sinner. Just imagine what it's going to be like to be in that perfect relationship with God. How much more worth are you going to feel whenever he tells you, I died for you. I died just so I could spend forever with you. You are worth my life. God is worth my life and my eternity. Christ went to the cross and it wasn't easy. But it says that he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. If you don't have a relationship with God, trust me, I understand the hopeless feeling that you have. I know what it's like. Maybe I'll finally get that job promotion. Maybe finally those people will be my friend. Maybe finally I'll get a family that wants to hang around me or whatever. And then you get those things and it's over. I got to see a concert over the weekend and this rapper got up on stage and he's doing his thing and he did a really good job. And this was at an arena. Now this arena was packed like there was not an empty seat there. It was incredible. It would have been a great opportunity for him to share the gospel because he's a Christian rapper. However, to my disappointment, but not to my surprise, he didn't. But while he was there, he said something really interesting to me. He said, you know, my whole life, since I started being successful with music, I always wondered what it'd be like if I could pack out an arena and do an arena tour. And he says, so, but I kind of... I kind of was, uh, you know, I didn't want to do it. I was scared to do this, but now I'm here and it's a lot of fun. And all that, could, that I could think about was, what next? What next? Now that this is over, that satisfaction that you have in packing out an arena, it's going to be really short-lived. What's going to have to be the next thing? I think that's how a lot of us live our lives. What's the next thing that's going to make me feel good? Is it going to be an amusement park? Is it going to be going out to eat or seeing a movie? What are you living your life for? Because here's the thing. Going through hard times is so much easier when you have hope. Life is so much more enjoyable and so, more, so much more joy-filled when you have a living hope, knowing that this is not the end of it. You can face destructive times. You can face hopeless situations with a hope, but that's only found in Christ. So today, if you're in a spot where you think that maybe you've messed up too much, maybe you've gone too far into your sin cycle, or maybe you don't have a relationship with God at all, and everything that I'm saying is complete gibberish. There is hope. His name is Jesus Christ. It says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You are more than welcome to come put your face to the ground and cry out for his forgiveness and say, thank you for dying for me. But if your pride keeps you in your seat... Just understand that, that hopelessness that you feel as you leave doesn't get better. There's temporary spots of relief, but this is as good as it gets. However, with the living hope that we have in Christ, it can get, it can get horrible in, in ways that other people can't understand how we can deal with it and we can still have joy because we know where we're going to end up, in the arms of our Father. Jesus Christ died for you, and he wants a relationship with you. As I close today, I just want to ask you guys, do you feel that tug? Do you feel God calling you to a relationship with him? Because if, if you can say that you've never had God call you, you can't leave here without knowing God is calling you by name today to be in a relationship with him. His Holy Spirit will fill you with joy. His Holy Spirit will fill you with endurance. 
so that we can make it through these tough spots. We have a body of Christ that loves you. You have pastors around you that care about you. You have resources to help take care of you. And all of that came from God to draw you to this moment for you to give your life to Him. Now, before I close, I just want to say, whenever I say give your life to Him, I don't mean give your Sundays to Him. I don't mean give Him three or four seconds in the morning when you say, God, thank you very much, be with me, and that's it. No, I mean give your life to Him. Let Him do what He wants with you, and I promise it's always going to be better than what you can imagine. Let's pray. God in heaven, I love you so much. The fact that you saved a sinner like me, the fact that you have so much love and so much patience for people that spit on you, the fact that you went to the cross after they'd whipped you, and at any moment you could have jumped off of there and said, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. And you didn't. You stayed there. The only thing that kept you there was love. That's the love that I want to have for people. The love that you gave to me and God, I'm so thankful for the sacrifice that you've made for me. And God, I pray that if there's anyone here in a dark hole, if there's anyone here that needs encouragement, anyone here that needs strength or needs to be saved, God, I pray that you draw them and call them into your kingdom. This shouldn't just be another Sunday that passes us by and we keep on living the same mundane, pointless, hopeless lives. God, you have a mission for us. I love you, Jesus Christ. I pray these things in your name. Amen. If anybody here needs to be prayed for, if anybody here needs a relationship with Christ, if anyone here needs help out of a dark hole, I'd like to ask you to come forward and we can pray.